guessing it's just this guy. Mm -hmm. Should be. You see mine? Yeah. I think you're good. Yeah. 
I don't have an input. <laughs> Someone's going to need to hit the input, I believe. Are you plugged in? I am, yeah. I think. Oh, now I am. Sorry. I guess I wasn't. Um, I don't think I do actually. Thank you.
call this. Call this meeting to order. This is the meeting of the Scarborough Planning Board. It's Thursday, September 9th. We will say, stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Doreen, will you call the roll, please? Rachel Henriksen? Here. Rick Meinking is absent. Roger Bealey? Here. Jennifer Ladd? Here. And Rick Duperry? Here. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the June 28th meeting. The, June uh, the July 19th minutes are not available. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you. Are there board comments, suggestions, emendations, amendments, deletions? Hearing. Hearing none, let's call the roll. Rick Duperry? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Roger Bealey? Yes. And Rachel Henriksen? Yes. The next item on the agenda is discussion of the remote meeting policy. Uh, if you'll notice, you have a, a, a document from Jay Chase concerning the issues of uh, the board having a policy uh, to govern remote meetings. Um, Jamel, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so as you all know, the state of emergency in regards to COVID uh, has ended. And recent action at the state level uh, that permits boards and committees to hold virtual meetings as moving forward, provided that um, boards and committees adopt their own policy. So generally, uh, the meeting is to be in person, except for emergency situations for board or committee members. And the town council here has adopted policy that maintain maintains uh, what we've been doing over the last year and a half in regards to uh, either hybrid or remote meeting participation. So staff has provided the planning board with a revised version of the council policy, uh, but members are expected to be in person whenever feasible. So just for some background, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, decided that um, they were uh, applicants and board or committee members uh, will would be coming in in person, and they provided remote access for public participation only. And then Sustainability Committee, which is the only other committee to vote on the policy so far, uh, followed Council's policy exactly. So there's three ways you guys can go about this, or I'm sure there are more, but three that I listed. Um, so you can either vote for traditional in-person meetings with no remote access, such as tonight, uh, public participation only in a virtual format, or follow the council's policy and move forward with hybrid meetings um, for public and applicants and members. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, discussion from board members. Any observations, questions? Yeah, Roger. Um, just a couple. Um, <clears throat> when I look at this first page, uh, Jamal, um, it, it sounds like MMA and legal counsel uh, does not want to allow, does not allow for town-wide policy that would apply to all town boards and committees. And then later it says the purpose is, you know, for this policy states clearly the intention of the town council, of the town council, that the other town public policies adopted a similar policy. I'm a little confused. Do, do, do we want to develop a town-wide policy that, that has the same provisions, or is can we have our own? So as the Sustainability Committee did, you can follow their policy um, and hold hybrid meetings, or you can decide to do anything else, whether it's full in-person or public participation only remote. Um, it's, it's up to you guys. OK. And then the other question I had, looking at the um, the conditions, um, like looking at the state, 
document as well as the one that Jay put together. There's a, um, there's a term, uh, the phrase urgent issue. That's, that's a pretty broad, it's pretty yes. broad. You know, uh, and when I was reading it, I was thinking of the situation we're in now where all of a sudden caseload, you know, COVID caseloads are going up again and, and when we don't want to get ourselves kind of locked into a situation where it gets kind of, you know, dicey, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the hybrid format probably offers the most flexibility. Um, I'm not really sure what, how to define urgent. I think it's different for everyone. Okay. Yeah, I, so. I, if I can just jump in, I would assume that if there were a town-wide um, urgent uh, emergency or urgent issue, that the town might say, from now on, you will all wear masks. From now on, everybody meets remote. In other words, that would then cover us. But in a situation like this, we continue to meet um, because there's been no emergency declaration. The state of emergency has, has passed. So in, in that case, what's our policy about allowing people, to, uh, members of the planning board, to be hybrid because that's not supposed to happen unless we have a policy that allows it. So that, that's what we're, we're looking at. Um, the, the zoning board of, it was a, the ZBA, right, that's got one. Yeah, they, they're kind of the closest to us in that they, like the planning board, have a quasi-judicial purpose and approach. Um, the sustainability committee uh, is a little more flexible in terms of rules and uh, is not really covered by any um, state regulations in terms of how it operates. So uh, Jay has come up with um, a possible policy that we can take a look at. Um, and it's set up in the framework that the MMA recommends if I think if we go too far afield, because there are legal issues involved, we might want to say, well, this we have a new draft policy, but somebody else is going to take a look at it to make sure we cover all of the state law that cover that that governs this. Um, yeah, my um, my concern is, you know, say say the um, the state doesn't issue an emergency declaration again. And yet, there there are members of the board that feel uncomfortable because of what's going on in the community, or something like that, regarding COVID. I would hate to see that they can't participate. You know, so I guess what I'm saying is, I I guess I for the time being, I I go with the the hybrid that we've been doing. Well, it, excuse me. What this policy uh, presents is the the conditions under which we have hybrid. In other words, people show up unless there is the existence of an emergency or urgent issue, uh, there is illness or other physical condition on the part of somebody, a member of the planning board, or a temporary absence from the jurisdiction where traveling to the meeting would cause the member to face significant difficulties to attend in person. In other words, there are opportunities for somebody to say, I can't be there. Uh, I have, I'm sick, I've got a sick child. Um, CMP just called me up and told me to get to Bangor, um, but I'll tune in on my way up. So there are opportunities uh, for somebody to meet remotely, but the default is we meet in person. I understand that. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm, I think that's, that's what it says in terms of the limited scope. And you'll notice, um, did they all get the revised? I do not believe so. All right, I had talked to Jay and Jamel before this and uh, requested as the same as the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals did, that um, under B, limited scope, the Planning Board members and applicants or their representatives slash consultants are expected to be physically present, except when being physically present is not practicable, including the following circumstances. So 
In other words, if we're here, there should be at least one representative sitting out there um, for each applicant. I, um, I did see that um, amended version, and I think that's a good, uh, a good edit. I, I guess my sense, I would also be in favor of, by policy, a hybrid model given these criteria um, for a number of reasons. One, you know, COVID or no COVID, you know, Ill, Ill, first of all, we're short staffed up here <laughs> currently. Um, and so, you know, until that changes, um, I, for example, could have attended this meeting last Monday as it was scheduled if there was a remote option because I, I physically couldn't be here, but I could have participated. Um, and because of the short numbers, that was one of the reasons that we had to reschedule. So, uh, you know, things like that, um, you know, that I think would be helpful. The other thing, you know, if heaven forbid anyone needed to quarantine or just literally knew, you know, knew that they weren't feeling well, had a cold or whatever, um, but felt up to participating remotely, it would mean that our meetings could continue to go on and not need to be rescheduled. Um, and I think that extending that same uh, opportunity to um, applicants and the representatives makes sense uh, for the same for the same reasons. Um, I just had one uh, one clarifying question. I guess in some of the um, sort of down below, I'm I wonder, Jamel, if you could just kind of go over again. It is the um, there were a couple bullets that I read among the, the documents that were sent out on this that made it sound like the public would only be allowed to participate remotely if a planning board member was participating remotely, and that if all planning board members were in person, then all public, you know, anyone from the public would also need to be in person. Is that a, am I misunderstanding that? I, can, uh, I raised the same question okay. earlier because it seemed to me that under uh, C5, A and B, that A and B contradict each other. Yeah. And that it may be that we don't need A, but simply can stay with B. It is the intention of the town council to allow members of the public to participate remotely in all public proceedings when technology and circumstances permit such as such participation. So my, my concern there was just about notice. So if someone, if a board member, for example, um, gave short notice that they were going to need or weren't feeling well or whatever the circumstances were, were going to need to participate remotely, um, that if that then triggered, you know, the public needing or only being allowed to participate remotely, they may not have a lot of time to, to, to know that, to understand that. So I think... But then what I think I heard you say about the two other boards that have talked about this was that they were either going full, you know, in person or that a public option would always be available for participating in these meetings, even if the full board was here, which my two cents on that is that I think that is very, um, I, I think that's a good, I think it's a good idea. Um, I don't know. How many people would take us up on that? I'm guessing, particularly after the last year and a half, that most people would not prefer one more Zoom meeting than they need to. But I think in terms of um, just making these meetings more accessible to people uh, who physically may find that difficult or have a hard time hearing or whatever the issues are or schedule-wise, um, I think that's just another good way of expanding the availability of this meeting uh, to the public. That's all. Thank you. I, I think um, if you look at B under that and B and C, um, B says, the town council says members of the public can attend all public, remotely all public hearings. And the second one, C, um, we can't determine that the attendance will be limited solely to remote methods. You know, unless if certainly if there is a uh, an emergency, which is section A1 above, um, certainly if the town hall is closed, then I, I think B and C, I think cover what you're interested in. 
Rick. Um, yeah, I would tend to agree that a hybrid model is what I would prefer, and it's not just personal preference. It's if you watched the news today or last night or the night before, it was 632 yesterday. I think it's 688 today. So, so COVID is not necessarily going away anytime soon. And, you know, I have an older parent and, you know, living with me now. So it's a concern there. And I also have other high risk people in my circle. Um, and if you look at the board where we, we've had two people drop out recently because of time constraints. And, and I know that that not, doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't mean that if we had the hybrid model all the time, those folks would have been able to participate because I'm not sure what their situation was. But potentially, the, you know, we had two, two good members that, that recently had left because they, they couldn't make it work. And of course, that puts the strain on the rest of us. And, and I know we're all here tonight to, to, to do our um, community service, public service, and help out the community here. But if one of us wasn't able to make it tonight, there would have been folks showing up with no notice at all to get heard and, and get their projects moving forward. And, and those projects wouldn't have been able to move forward. And you also notice, I mean, there's no one here from the Scarborough Leader. There's no one, the, the, I count four people in, the, in 40 seats and that's not the norm for this, for this forum. Um, and you've got Rick Miking, uh, who's a great person and, and, and he's got work commitments and I have work commitments and Jen has work commitments and childcare commitments. Um, so I think I've said enough, but I think that it, it makes sense now that we have had the hybrid model and, and made that a, an option where we only have the four people, and even when we have six people, before, if for some reason there was, you know, in my world, a system emergency and, and I needed to get people's power back on and I couldn't make it, it wasn't such a big deal because there was two other people to help out, and now we don't have those two other people. So if someone can't make it, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so I would vote for the hybrid model. And I think until we get new members and until COVID goes away, I don't see the normal model actually working, but that's, that's my thoughts and my vote. All right. Um, thank you. I please rest assured that I've been nagging members of the appointments committee, um, to find us some people. And I, at this point, um, I don't know, well, it, it, at the beginning of the week, there was nobody in the pipeline. So I don't know if, if that's changed, but that's what it was. But if you take a look at B, uh, what happens in, in B, the limited in scope, is it really sets up a hybrid model. In other words, people are expected to be present physically, except and then it gives some conditions when being physically present is not practicable, including the following circumstances. You know, it says, uh, including the following circumstances, that language in contract negotiations actually also means, but not limited to. Uh, and then um, there are three, uh, three following circumstances, the emergency or urgent issue, illness or physical condition, temporary absence from the jurisdiction. Um, that does not preclude somebody else from calling to say, this is what's going on and I simply can't do it. I think from, from my perspective, um, what's important to me is knowing ahead of time um, because um, I don't want to end up scrambling or as you talked about, Rick, having to put out a notice that says oh, all of you people who are going to come and talk about your applications, we don't have a quorum anymore. Now, if we can get two alternates, we can we can breathe we can breathe easier on that. But so it it actually sets up in a kind of a roundabout way the opportunity for hybrid 
You're present unless. That's what it says. So I guess I have to ask a clarifying question is you're saying that um, there would be a hybrid uh, if for some reason you were able to attend remotely but you couldn't um, be, because of whatever the circumstances is there would be the methodology to do that there would be the there would be a way to do that. Well, I think if we do what we've been doing, which basically says that we will be always offering the public an opportunity um, to attend remotely, then it would just be a matter of getting uh, the, the Zoom code to the board member who had to attend remotely. In other words, Zoom would already be set up, okay. already be advertised, already have a a URL out there right. um, so that uh, by agreeing that the public always has that option, we actually allow the board members some flexibility if if they need it. Okay. So, and I, that makes sense, and I'd, I'd leave it with these two comments. One is um, that's, I know you're working diligently to get two new board members on, and we'd seriously, you know, appreciate that. Um, as far as notice goes, and I completely understand that advance notice would be the best thing. Um, unfortunately, even with advance notice now, we still have to ch cancel and reschedule because we don't have those members. But if we, if we had those members, advance notice would be good. Unfortunately, um, there are times where, in, at least in my, my situation, there's not going to be a lot of advance notice. And, and, it's, and it's life. I mean, Dean, not to point at Jen, but she's sitting right next to me. If, if she... If her child care person calls up and says, hey, I just got in a car accident, um, or my mother just had a heart attack, and I can't be there to help you with your children, she can't just give them a box of candy and sit them in front of the TV, because I've done that before. That doesn't work. That's not a good plan. Um, so she's, so, so we're in a situation where um, we need that ability to do that. Um, and I don't, you know, I think it would be good to have that as a, you know, this is kind of saying, well, okay, if it's a, if it's a, um, you know, a, a illness or public fire or what, whatever it says, I think it, you know, I don't know how often we take advantage of it, but I, I think it needs to be something that's there. And honestly, with COVID, until the numbers go back down, I don't know how comfortable everybody else felt, but I didn't, I have been completely avoiding public situations um, with more than, you know, two people if I possibly can. And our, our rules, our corporate rules are we can't be within six feet of each other um, and we have to, so can't have two people in a truck, you can't have more than four people in a room. Um, that's, we have, we have all those rules, conference rooms are red taped off, you can't even go in the conference rooms and yet you know, here we're sitting in a pretty, what could have been 40 people out there with no masks because there's no mask mandate, right? So I think until COVID is um, over, we need to have the hybrid model, not for illness and injury and fire and theft, but as a normal thing. All right. I, sorry. Yeah, let me point out that uh, the language says are expected to be physically present except when being physically present is not practicable. Does that cover? I, I, we, if, if we start making a list of all of those things that count for you oh. not coming, or all of a sudden, well, I've got a list too. You know, if my husband wants to go out and do something, well, you know, I may want to go with him. There's, there's just a whole lot of, in other words, I know that's ridiculous, but there are a whole lot of things all of a sudden that people start saying, I got to do my shot, I got to pick up my medicine. And, you know, that begs the question, why didn't you do it five hours ago when you were in the store? So the, sometimes the language that simply says when being physically present is not practicable, um, specifying three things but not limiting three things, that that assumes that board members uh, are responsible people who aren't going to call up because for a frivolous reason. 
that they are going to understand, and, and that's what you all have been doing, understanding your obligations uh, to the folks who show up, uh, to the folks who come, and, and to the rest of the board members. Um, I, I believe you're all going to be here if you can be here. And if you can't, and then you, you let us know, then I also am under the assumption that you really can. Something has come up. Something's going on. It is not practicable. So, so I, that, you know, I, I don't know how that would be interpreted by other people. That's the way I interpret it. And, and I respect your sense of responsibility to the, the town and the role you play. So I'll, I'll go back. Is this language acceptable? We had the question, the limited in scope, and the question on um, C5, eliminating A, and just keeping the B and the C uh, to reinforce that the, these meetings are open and will be open remotely to the, the public. Anything? Roger? Yeah, so just to be clear, are we basically saying that um, we expect everybody to be here in person, but if they can't for you know, a legitimate reason that we can do a hybrid? Yes. Okay. Excuse me, let me turn the microphone on. Yes. Okay. Um, the hybrid is, is an option when people cannot attend for these reasons. Okay. And these reasons being using pretty broad language is not practicable. And when it talks about following circumstances, it does not eliminate other circumstances. It was really good in arbitrations. Uh, if there are no more comments, uh, do I hear a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion to accept uh, Jay's version of this, right? With the proposed changes. Yes. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you. Additional comments? I would just add that um, at least in this list of, of four items that they have here in B, COVID should be considered if the, if the CDC and the public health officials are telling folks we shouldn't meet in public, then I believe that's the policy we should follow. I, I think that's covered in one. Yeah. The existence of an emergency or urgent issue that requires the full planning board to re meet remotely. In other words, if, an, if a COVID emergency, if so, the word comes down from the CDC, um, if the town council decides we're going to go, the town hall is going to be closed, we're going to go back to remote. Um, you know, it would be the same thing as if uh, um, all of a sudden all of the lights at Dunstan Corner go out. In other words, if a hurricane comes, some sort of an emergency or urgent issue, that decision is, is actually made beyond this board. Roger. Um, just to expand upon what I think uh, Rick is trying to get at uh, on B2, which pertains to individual members versus one which pertains to the full board, I had actually written in um, I was going to suggest this, but um, illness or other physical conditions are, and I was going to add community health safety, which would cover something like COVID. And, and what I was getting at is, um, you know, like, like Rick said, if you have, a say, somebody that you're in contact with that might be, you know, um, 
subject to COVID, okay, whether it's a child under 12 or anybody, um, that may affect an individual and they may feel uncomfortable coming to a, especially if there's a large gathering. Um, do you mean if an individual is, needs to go into quarantine? No, just, just, um, just, just for instance, say, say the case, uh, case load, the case count keeps going up and there's no, you know, the state still does not react to it. In other words, they don't come out with mandates or anything like that. But the individual members are getting a little concerned because of their, their particular situation with their family or other people they come in contact with it on a daily basis. And I thought something like community health safety could be a justification. I mean, you can't, um, but that's just a, just well, yeah, I, I'm trying to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just running through what I think we have to be careful of is this participation policy will be over, will, will continue when COVID is done. Well, it, it, so so it, does your language cover more than COVID? Because I, I don't think we want a policy that limits itself to that one issue. But I think your language reflects a wider community concern, so that may work. Well, I, I, guess, I guess where I come down on this is if we're going to retain the flexibility of having a hybrid meeting like we've had in the past, like, like for instance, some, I think the June meetings, I, I participated via Zoom instead of coming here in some of the workshops as well. Now, if we're going to retain that same thing, then I'm fine with everything. Well, I think we need to, I, I actually like your idea of the health, adding a health emergency, a community health emergency, um, because it does take care of that. Is, would that be a problem, Jamil? I was thinking that you could add it to number B1, the existence of an emergency or urgent issue that requires the full planning board or individual member to meet remotely. That way it's or an individual member personalized. because that becomes the emergency or urgent issue. And that allows the discretion of the individual member. Does that work? Yeah. It works. Is that okay with you, Rick? Yeah. Jen, that okay? Uh, yes, that's fine with me. I have one other question. Okay. At the risk of further muddying the waters, would this apply to oh, weather, sure. weather incidents? It was bad weather and city hall, town hall was closed. For yeah. weather, could we meet anyway if we had the, vir the a virtual option? We we could we could meet remotely. Yeah. Might just be another option. Uh, in, in other words, if yeah, if it. the if the town hall closes down. And we already have the Zoom set up. Um, it's possible. That's probably considered an urgent issue. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Or, an emergency. or an emergency. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, you I know, guess. we may have snow. I mean, nobody doesn't love a snow day, but. Um, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I think the the point uh, of this policy is to ensure we can continue working um, while allowing the members of the board some comfort or flexibility. Um, but that the preferred status is meeting in person, all of us, including the two alternates who will be coming along. But that's not always possible. And when it's not, this is the, here are the guidelines. Do you have that change? I, I think it, it actually has come up in our conversations too, and to your point, it's, I don't think there's a well-defined what's an emergency for each individual member kind of mm -hmm. looks at that themselves. Like you had said, Rachel, it's really at your discretion and knowing your responsibilities. Whereas it could be someone can walk in a snowstorm here, but someone across town is, I'm meeting remotely because to me it's an emergency, right? So it gives it mm -hmm. to each individual. So just because there's a snowstorm and everyone else is showing up, Maybe someone in North Scar was saying, I'm, I'm not going to chance it. It's, it's an emergency in my eyes. You know what I mean? So I think it's for each individual board member, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think defined. putting in the individual in number one allows that flexibility so that folks can be comfortable. comfortable. Mm -hmm. You have that change? Yes. All right, let's, um, if we are done with this, let us have a vote. Doreen, please call the roll. Jennifer Ladd. 
Yes. Richie Perry. Yes. Roger Vila. Yes. And Rachel Henriksen. Yes. Thank you. We are now the third group in town that have a policy. Is it 10 o'clock yet? It's not 10 o'clock yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> you poor thing. The next item on the agenda is Crossroads Holding LLC request a subdivision amendment review. Third amendment for the town center residential subdivision at the Downs Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4. Uh, this is a public, uh, allows for a public hearing. So at some point we will find out how many people are online or in the audience. Dan? Do you want me to jump in? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I keep, you know, I keep trying to ask Dan to go first. And sorry, Dan. Go ahead, oh, yeah. Jim. I'm sorry. I as the, so as the board may recall, the applicant was last before you all in June. The applicant's proposing to create uh, six new lots within the existing plan development area, uh, along with the connection of Front Runner Way and Hackamore Avenue and the creation of a private driveway. Uh, while there are no remaining main elements uh, in the staff memo, the staff would like to note that the police department does have some concerns about the proposed width of the private driveway, has requested a modified design. Um, so the applicant should be sure to discuss this this evening. And while the main DEP has not granted approval for the project, the applicant did provide uh, staff uh, with a letter from DEP stating that, stating that a decision on their permit will be made soon. So staff's generally comfortable with the proposal um, and has provided the board with the draft motion with conditions. Turn it back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good evening. Uh, Dan Bacon here on behalf of the Downs. Um, and we have this item on the agenda. I also noticed we heard, sort of have a lineup of items coming up. They're all uh, interrelated for the town center residential uh, phases forthcoming. We've been working on them uh, since, since April and are eager to, to kind of finalize things to, to help the project continue uh, this fall and this winter. Um, as Jamal indicated, we've been before the board a few times now. Um, I think also since our workshop on traffic, we also received the main DOT traffic movement permit. So we're quite pleased with about that. So that permit is in place for this phase as well as the build out. Um, kind of moving forward for the next number of years with the project. And to add a little color to the DEP approval, um, the permit isn't quite written, um, but they've worked with us and signed off on sort of the planning board aspects of what's uh, before you. The reason it actually hasn't been issued yet is we're working on finalizing sort of the solid waste section as it relates to the grandstand, um, which is not in this area of the project, um, and we, we believe we answer their questions. But as we've been applying for these DEP permits, they've been larger areas, which is a bit of a blessing and a curse in terms of when we're applying to smaller areas for subdivision to the town. Um, so I wanted to give that kind of context to give the board uh, more comfort around the, the DEP permit, satisfying what, what you need to review this evening. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to have Drew just kind of walk through the, the final updates that we've done since we last presented to you, and also our work with the police department, which uh, Jamel um, outlined. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over the scope of this project. I'm sure everyone's seen it a couple times now, but just to formally introduce it one more time. Um, this is the entire Downs Master Plan, one of the more recent ones, um, and I have circled in red here um, the actual third amended location. So it's kind of broken up into two pieces. Let me get the mouse out of the way there. Two pieces on the south side of Town Center Residential and also the north side closer to the Grand Sin that Dan just mentioned. So I flipped everyone 90 degrees here on an engineering plan. Um, so everything in the dashed outline is essentially the third amended subdivision location. Um, on the north side, we have a large assisted living lot that's going to house an assisted living facility that facility will be in front of the board, I believe, next meeting. Um, with that, we're providing a 250-foot roadway extension along Downs Road, essentially to get the driveway in for that facility. Um, that includes utility extensions with that as well. On the south side, we have an additional four lots to close off the second cottages of the green down here. And 
um, a private access way around the back of it to serve those lots as they're going to be alley loaded. And that private access way will also serve lot 35, which is the multifamily development for this project that will be coming under separate cover. Um, again, so this is just a blow up of the northern portion of the Town Center Residential Third Amended that I just described. Um, no real changes over here from the last time you guys have seen it. Um, it's essentially the, the cross country sewer run that's in the alignment of the future Downs Road to a pump station cutting across the lot 34 assisted living lot. So there's really no changes on this from the last time. Um, on the southern portion, again, the layout is essentially the same. The private access way is still the same and um, basically all the same features that was on it before. I want to quickly go over some of the key updates and comments we've had since the last time we've been before you. Um, so I provided the Port and Water District approval to the town so we have all of our utility approvals in place. Um, as Dan alluded to, we met with the police department on September 2nd to discuss the Pacer Way private way intersection that you saw in the comments that were provided um, to us and to the planning board. Um, really it was just making it more obvious that the private way and where the public way kind of intersects, like where that line is drawn. So that's obvious for not only for visitors, for residents, but also for the police department on, okay, I'm on the public way and now I, now I get onto the private section of the road. So we met with the police chief and we came to an agreement where we're gonna have some more formal gateway signage, we're calling it, at the, where the intersection of essentially, and let me move up here to the location, right around here where it actually goes from a public way to a private way. And that met the needs of the police department. Um, so I know in the comment response that was provided to possibly um, shrink the roadway width. Um, the only issue with that is this portion of the, where it becomes a private drive is actually part of a previously approved subdivision that's actually under construction right now. So there's some logistical issues with actually doing that. So instead we came to an agreement on, again, having some gateway signage to make it more obvious that you're coming into a private, um, a private way. And I'm not talking about anything super elaborate when it comes to gateway signage, just something on either side of the way that make, either side of the road that makes it obvious that you're coming into a private way rather than just a, blue sign up on them. So that's what we came to the agreement on um, and they're very helpful and uh, it was a good meeting that we had. Um, last time we were in front of you, we talked about adding street trees and the street light on the corner of the private way. They're very minimal, but we did add those. So those were shown on your packages. Um, the street light was on the corner here per the town's comment and the street trees were added to Downs Road. Um, I did allude to last time a few, uh, a few times, I think that the intersection of Hackmore and front runner way. Um, it was previously skewed and as promised, we did make it more like a traditional 90 degree alignment. So that's shown on this plan and on the plans and the uh, items next on your agenda. So that was um, delivered as promised. Um, placemaking, we have added some placemaking thresholds in the corner here of this, uh, this gravel wetland park that we're calling it. And then that is also going to get translated to the fourth amended and you'll see that in an upcoming and actually your next agenda item that we're kind of keeping that theme going across um, this project and hopefully we'll carry it forward too as we get to the town center there. Um, and then Dan mentioned and talked about the main DEP level two permit. Um, again, just echoing that really all the infrastructure and the layout and all the stormwater ponds and really the heavy lifting of the permit is completely done and signed off for. It's simply just getting it to the state level, getting it to Augusta and getting that signature on it is really kind of where we're at with it. And then, you know, they're extremely busy over there. So um, they're taking every, every day they possibly can. And that's, uh, it's understandable. So that's where we had that letter and was provided to the town. So that's all um, I really have for tonight. Um, happy to hear any questions or answer any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is uh, the time for public comment. Is there anybody in the room who'd like to rush up to the uh, um, to the microphone? Or do we have anybody online? We aren't running a meeting remotely, so it's just everyone here. <laughs> okay, we're it. Uh, let's uh, move to board comments. Anybody like to start? Questions? Um, I'm pretty well satisfied. I think they've um, they've answered, responded to all of the you know the various concerns. So I'm I'm all set. All right, thank you. Um, 
the board, did, you, did do you all receive a copy of a draft motion? Okay, uh, Rick. Yeah, I just have. Uh, we've seen this a couple times, so I, I'm and Dan and you've done a great job. So I did have one co co question though that I have to ask on your um, turning one of your on your turning movement drawings. You have four feet of reinforced turf. And I've just never seen that terminology before. And I was really curious as to what is reinforced turf. It, it appears that the, you know, the truck could drive on it uh, if it has to, to make the turn. So could you brief me on that? Just yeah, correct. So and we've used this on a, different areas of the project as well, numerous times. So um, working with the fire department, it's really just the extra width provided on the fire lanes. Um, so the reinforced turf is essentially just a little bit deeper loam on top of gravel. So we basically will take the roadway gravels, we'll extend them out a little bit further, and instead of paving it, we'll put the reinforced turf on top of it. And essentially it just allows so a truck's not gonna sink into it. Um, and it does get plowed and maintained as well. So it's just a way to reduce our impervious area, but at the same time, um, give the fire department um, and the emergency vehicles the room they need to make the turn onto the private alleys. Okay. Yeah, the rest of it looks good as far as I'm concerned. All right, and for a change, I have no comments. Uh, so uh, if the board is ready, I can read the draft motion. Are we ready? Thank you. I move to approve the project title Third Amendment Subdivision Plan Town Center Residential Subdivision proposed by Crossroads Holdings, LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated 8-9-21, with the following findings and conditions. <clears throat> findings, the proposed Third Amendment subdivision plan includes the creation of six new lots within the existing subdivision area. The lots are intended to include a mix of single family, four lots, an, assist, an assisted living facility lot, and a multi-unit condominium lot with associated utilities, parking, pedestrian ways, common spaces, and landscaping. The proposal also includes the formal connection of Front Runner Way and Hackamore Avenue and the creation of a private driveway servicing five new lots. The subdivision is located within the Crossroads Plan Development CPD Zoning District and is further identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R52, lot 4. Conditions. Prior to the signing and release of the final plan, the applicant shall revise the plan set to modify the private access drive as noted in the staff review memo dated 9921. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, address the review comments in the traf traffic peer review memo by Traffic Solutions dated 8-23-21. B, coordinate with the police department in regards to the proposed name of the private driveway and addressing logistics for the project. C, pay the traffic impact fees. D, pay the recreation contribution fees. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall A, provide a copy of the main DEP permit to the planning department. B, co coordinate a pre-construction meeting. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Do I hear a second? Second. Let's call the roll. Rachel Henriksen? Yes. Roger Bealy? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Meinkin. I mean, Rick Duperry. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Third Amendment subdivision has passed. And number seven, Crossroads Holding, LLC, requests a subdivision amendment review, fourth amendment, for the town center residential subdivision at the Downs, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as the board may recall, this was also before you all last uh, in June. The applicant's proposing to create a total of 20 new single-family lots, 
three new multifamily lots and extend Pacer Way, Peckhamore Avenue, and Front Runner Way. The proposal also includes a utility and pedestrian connection to the Sawgrass to Sawgrass Drive, along with a pedestrian connection to the existing Grist Mill neighborhood uh, within phase one of the Downs. So during the previous review, staff identified concerns uh, with a reduced centerline radius as part of the proposed design of Pacer Way. While the designer has resolved the issue by modifying the design of the street to meet town standards, it appears that the right of way was not updated as well. So Public Works has expressed concerns with the new roadway layout and is not following engineering industry standards, which seeks to have the roadway within the center of a public right of way. So staff has recommended that the applicant update the subdivision, subdivision plan uh, depicting Pacer Way within the center of the future public right of way. This modification to the plan will also impact lot dimensions, which will need to be reviewed uh, by staff and the board. Staff has also noted that a physical barrier should be provided along the property boundary of lot 40 and 55 to ensure no future obstructions related to the required site distance for the proposed full access driveway to lot 40 along Pacer Way. And again, while the DEP did not grant approval for the project, uh, the applicant did provide a letter from DEP saying that, stating that a decision on the permit will be made soon. So given that, if, that several or a few plan modifications are still required, uh, due to the right-of-way work, staff recommends that the board consider this project to be placed on the September 20th agenda as a consent item if the board is comfortable with that approach. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Board members. Roger, do you want to kick it off? I'm okay. sorry. Real quick, you know, I'm sooner or later, I'm going to get this back and forth. I, I, you know, Dan, I see you standing up there, and you're all eager to speak, so I call on you first, because, you know, there you right. are. Uh, and now and I remember to so call long, on Mel, but I time. forgot you, so everything is even, right? It is. Okay. Let's I'll go be quick, Dan. and I'll turn it over to, the, to Drew as the, as the expert. Um, I just wanted to elaborate on this is really an extension of what you just approved. So this will extend Pacer Way, as shown on the master plan here, uh, to loop around to Hackamore and Hackamore's extension um, from where you just approved it in this location with Front Runner all the way down to Pacer. And then as Jamel indicated, we're providing a pedestrian connection to the Sawgrass neighborhood um, as well as a utility connection. So there'll be... Um, a water and sewer connection, um, as well as a pedestrian bike connection. That's something that I know we talked about at the last meeting, the downtown committee has been talking a lot about, you know, having um, good connections as well as this, this board, um, but the downtown committee has been talking about connections to the town campus, et cetera. So I just wanted to flag that linkage is being made um, with this latest subdivision amendment. In addition to that, um, Drew's going to kind of walk through the plan uh, tweaks that we've made since the last round of staff comments. Um, we were able to accommodate those changes around the, the right-of-way and having the road infrastructure centered in the right-of-way um, and the minor adjustments to the lots that were a uh, ripple effect of that as well as kind of finalizing the design for the site distance that the traffic consultant um, had asked for in terms of a driveway for the condominium application that's come, kind of coming next. So um, we're getting really close on this um, and, and appreciate kind of working with the board and staff on enabling either an approval tonight or an approval at, as a consent um, at the next meeting so that we can kind of proceed this fall um, given that both the condos and the apartment, the next two, two site plans are dependent on this application to kind of move forward. Um, so. With that, I'll let Drew kind of give you a, a quick overview of those detailed changes and then back to the board. Thank you, Dan. Again, Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer. I will be brief here. Um, so again, the overall master plan, I won't bother getting into that. Um, as Dan mentioned, we're really just talking about extensions of Hackamore Ave, Pacer Way, and then a small extension of Front Runner Way up in this direction. So this completes the loop for town center residential and essentially, well, most of town center residential essentially gets in us about 20 single family lots and three multifamily lots that are kind of centrally located right here. Um, as I've discussed previously, this is a 
looking at this as a construction phase project. So in this location, the unhighlighted portion, which is right here, if you can follow my hand, and the connection to sawgrass would be the first construction phase to get uh, these next two multifamily lots on your agenda, lot 40 and 41, um, activated first. And then with that comes basically two single family lots. Um, just because of the proximity to the roadways we're going to be constructing, as well as the stormwater facility. Uh, the second phase would be the connection of Pacer to Hackamore Ave with um, these 19 or 18 single family lots. And then the third phase, and again, construction phase, not approval phases, um, would be the front runner way extension uh, to create the third multifamily lot, which is lot 42. Um, I'm going to just quickly go over. Um, just what's changed since the last time you guys have seen this. Um, so in working with the sewer department, this really relates to, or excuse me, Scarborough Sanitary District, and this really relates to lot 41. Um, it's been requested that we send the, the float from lot 41 to the proposed second pump station on site, which is just off the page here to the left that we're working on actively with the Scarborough Sanitary District. So as part of this application, we're actually bringing the sewer down front runaway and kind of across to grab that. Um, it's still gravity fed previously. It was going to be connected into a stub that we left in a second phase, but based on capacity, um, it's been requested it goes to that direction. So that's just one small change that we've had. Um, really doesn't affect any type of layout or anything. It's just a below ground change, I'll call it. Um, and then we're actually sending one building of lot 40. And again, it relates to the next Two items, they're going over to sawgrass on a low pressure system. So again, no real actual layout changes, anything you can actually see, it's just underground utilities. Um, and as Dan mentioned, as the town mentioned, um, we revised the center line radii for the road um, and it was requested to move the right of way with it just so it's consistent as with uh, the rest of the project. We're happy to do that. Um, I wanted to provide this graphic here that just shows essentially what the change is. So. Um, let's see if I can get this right here. Red is area that is being allocated back into the right of way and blue is what areas are the adjacent lots are growing. So uh, regardless <laughs> of that confusing language, it's essentially this is the only change. So the highlighted portion is what the right of way is changing to and from. So it's, it's, we're talking about four to five feet on either side. There's no infrastructure changes because everything fit within the right of way before and it's going to fit within it after. It's just simply a couple hundred square feet on each of these lots um, just to center everything together. So I just want to provide this to show the kind of the scope of the right of way change that we're talking about. Um, you wouldn't even be able to see it if you had two plans back to back unless I did an overlay like this. Um, I do want to mention I did meet with the town engineer today, um, showed these plans, discussed them, and um, we came to a consensus that this was this was good and that it was, it was all set and there's pretty minor changes here. Um, the lot 55, lot 40 site distance uh, that was brought up in the town comments as well as the traffic peer review comments. Um, as Dan mentioned, we're gonna, we had provided a landscaping buffer along that property line. Let me get to it so you guys, so I'm talking about this property line right here, which provides the site distance for this entrance on lot 40. Uh, we had provided a row of trees there previously um, and it's been requested that change to something more structural, such as a fence. Um, so we're going to provide a picket fence there along that. We're happy to do that. It still accomplishes the same purpose. It's just probably a little bit more sturdy and that we're not relying on the growth of the trees and, and possibly, you know, branches poking out into it. So we're happy to do that. And we've revised the plans to show a fence along that location there. Um, another comment in there, which didn't get brought, was just the gravel wetland four access drive. Um, again, I met with the town engineer today, and uh, we're all set there. We just we're providing a 10 foot maintenance path all the way down, all the way through, and around the pond, um, as as we've done previous phases, and uh, um, um, just so that we can get a truck down there to be able to maintain plunge pool and other stormwater facilities. Um, Placemaking. This is uh, the other side that I alluded to in the third amended presentation. This is. Um, Hackamore Ave and Pacer Way intersection right near Sawgrass. It's the same kind of idea of a threshold design um, in the corner of the existing track area that you can actually see here that will be gone um, with this development. But uh, it's the same idea that we are providing with the third amended. And again, I won't reiterate the main DEP, but again, this is just the DEP signed off on all the infrastructure in this phase and basically everything we're talking about tonight. Um, that's all I have again, and happy to hear some comments and uh, any further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll try the board. 
comments, questions? Sure. Um, so I'm curious based on your graphic and the comment, the staff comment about the positioning of the roadway in the right of way. Um, will you be moving that so that the road is more centralized in the right of way? Or I understand what you showed sort of the, the differential between what was and what is, but I'm, I'm not clear on whether or not you're relocating the road right in that corner. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry to not make it clear there. Um, so we've revised, so previously we had the road at a sharper curve. Um, and it was requested to revise it to meet the town standard. We were asking for a waiver. We said, okay. So we did that and we didn't change the right of way. And then it was requested that the right of way changes with it. We were trying to maximize the lot areas previously. After we looked at it for just moving the right of way, we realized that this is all that's changing and that that's fine. So all we're doing is removing the right of way now to match the road center line. Um, so that it meets the town, what they're requesting and, and the town standard. So, so. so when you're finished, the road will meet town standards and will also be centered in the right of way. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I only bring that up having worked on many roads that are not in the middle of the right of way. And, um, you know, it's doable, but it's not preferable. And for a place like this, that is a complete blank slate, um, that changes on behalf of anyone doing this work way down the road. Thank you for <laughs> taking the time to do that. Um, I think I only have two other comments. One is, uh, actually one you sort of answered, um, about the actual treatment that you'd be implementing in terms of how to preserve the site distance on that corner. And just remind me, the adjacent lot to the north of that little sliver will be, a, that's a single family lot, is that Correct. right? Um, so, okay, um, I guess just, uh, I'm just curious, like if, I don't know, you never know what happens, someone moves in, so you put the picket fence in maybe as part of the larger lot, um, and if the person that owns that property goes on to plant like a solid wall of arborvitaes or something like that, I'm just curious if there's any, I guess my overall question is, what if the um, proposed treatment intended to preserve that site distance somehow doesn't work. <laughs> so either, um, you know what I mean? Like if, you're, if, if, if your fence is good, nobody plants anything else, but maybe the, um, just the angle of it is such that in real life, maybe it is still difficult to see. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what other, what other options might present themselves and again this is, comes from other places where that's no it, the case. It, it's a good question because we actually went over this exact same thing with the traffic peer reviewers so this is how we got here was we went through all these discussions and we essentially said well we have to do something that someone can't change later right so that so first step we're putting the fence on the lot 40 sex is benefiting lot 40 mm -hmm. so they're going to own and control the fence and the homeowner will need to be made aware of that that that's obviously their property so they can't either remove it or put something on the other side of it as it's on lot 40's side um, in addition there's, we're putting notes on the subdivision plan, plan so that's legally binding that essentially if that can't be maintained, there's actually other options on the subdivision plan note that say what has to happen to this entrance if this can't be maintained. Okay. So we're not anticipating that we're gonna have that issue, but just okay. to kind of cover everything in your point, um, there are some notes that are legally binding on that subdivision plan. Okay. Um, and then my last question has to do with the pedestrian connection to Sawgrass which I also think is um, super important for this phase of development, but also the, this, in, the entire development overall, because correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is, the only, this is the only connection to an existing neighborhood. Is that right? Uh, in phase one, there's a connection to Technology Way, which is a light okay. industrial park, so it's not a neighborhood per se, but. Okay, sure. Um, in light of all of the other plans that we've seen from your overall team with incredibly thoughtful placemaking um, added to them, including on this particular connection with the, I like the, you know, the horseshoe sort of tying that piece into the existing road network um, that you'll be establishing. 
But uh, other than that, it, it really just seems like t like um, dots connected with a line. And so I just wonder if there's any other opportunity for a more organic connection, um, a, a slightly different shape, something that's a little more, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm an engineer, so like the fact that it didn't go to the middle of the other <laughs> road, my eyes were just like, ah, eh, but I understand why, because the sidewalk's on, only on one side. So I don't know if there's an opportunity for, for something just, do you know what I'm trying to say? Just a little more uh, creative, I guess, and welcoming bec because this, I believe that this is such an important um, invitation, I'll say, to the rest of our community to visit your development in a way that is not car-centered. And so many of the other entrances and exits from this overall, this very large development um, are car-centered. And so I think um, I have tuned into some, but not all of the downtown um, meeting conversations. And so I'm, I'm hoping that they're sort of reiterating some of the same things, which is that these types of connections to our existing community are really important. And so I, I guess, I would just say, you know, anything else that you can do to make this really inviting um, to your neighbors, to the neighbors here, and to the residents to, you know, to connect to the adjacent neighborhoods, uh, I think would go a long way. And at least based on what I'm seeing here, there's, there aren't a lot of um, physical or logistical reasons that I'm seeing that would preclude that. So that's all. Thanks. Can I speak to that? Yep. Um, and Drew put up the engineering version of the plan. Um, so you should have in your packages. Because maybe, Drew is also an engineer. <laughs> right. No offense, Drew or Jen. Um, but there is a planting plan and a, a plan that has amenities that go along with the horseshoe shape. So it was um, kind of deliberately designed to include those. Um, and if we can, I don't know if, I, don't, I guess we don't have it in this slideshow, but we in your packages there is one, so um, it does go a good bit further than what you're seeing on this graphic. Sure, and I guess just to elaborate a little bit on that, um, that the horseshoe piece shown here, I think is great. I, I'm just curious if there's any opportunity to sort of replicate that at the actual connection at the property line where you're tying into the other um, the other neighborhood, and it doesn't oh. necessarily have to be horseshoe shaped, but um, you know that's. For, for anyone walking or using this pathway, I'm thinking like from the park or, you know, uh, kids coming to and from school, this is their gateway. This is the gateway to, um, to the downs by foot and by bike. And um, so I just, I'm looking forward to seeing how you um, show that. So you're referring to in the sawgrass neighborhood, not in the project? In, in the project, but at the, at the sawgrass end. So if you were walking from sawgrass to the downs, you know, the, the connection at your neighborhood end is one thing, but once, once you're getting to the street network, um, now you have the organic shapes, now you have the placemaking, now you have the benches. Um, and again, you know, you probably don't need a bench at the property line, but I, you know, I think even just some, um, a little more organic alignment even um, could be more inviting. That's all. Okay. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Jen, anything else? All right, thanks. Rick? Um, I just have one question, actually. On your phasing diagram, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, that's, um, you have color-coded there. Do you have, based on your, whatever, marketing and sales and stuff, do you have any idea of the timing of that, that phasing? Is that, is that a, you know, six months for each phase? Is that a year for the entire build-out? What's... And it, not that it's critical, but it's just from a, how's it gonna look while it's in process kind of thing. Sure. Um, so phase one, we anticipate starting um, as soon as we can. So this fall, it's pretty critical that we are able to start to get foundations in the ground. Um, so phase one is lots 40, 41, um, and then 
43 and 44. So this white area, Rick, um, so that'll start, you know, in the next month or so. The phase two, um, we're anticipating that will start early next year. Um, and in part, it's due to kind of growth permit reasons and, and getting building permits. Um, but we're anticipating that being uh, early uh, 2022 start for construction. Um, phase three is likely also to be sort of a spring um, construction period. Uh, we don't have a design yet for phase three. That's the, that's the front runner extension and uh, the land that's north of Hackamore. So we anticipate that to be the third phase, of course, timing wise and also uh, start wise with more of a spring, spring 22 start. So we're trying to, to build them as concurrently as possible um, so that there isn't um, a lot of construction activity with new residents um, and, and also phase our construction and our construction routes so that we're not kind of coming through newly occupied neighborhoods and we're really kind of utilizing sort of the ultimately kind of the track area to um, stage construction and, and have truck routes so that we continue to kind of build and then um, you know working away from what is complete if you will so dan is the intent kind of it's not necessarily one phase is going to finish and the next phase is going to start they're going to kind of overlap a little bit they're going to overlap but stagger okay. starts and then therefore stagger finishes, but try to be, you know, not have a lot of delay in finishing, you know, years so that um, it's more um, comfortable for, for new homeowners. Okay. Yeah, you know, obviously you want to, I'm sure you guys are going to do a good job, but you, you it's, it's, it's hard for people to live with a construction site next door, so it's nice when it can kind of just flow through and and be done. So, but I know it's a challenge. From you have to sell the lots and you have to develop the property. So, um, just didn't want to see it stalled at any point, if at all possible. You know what I mean? So, thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'm all set. All right, Roger's all set. Um, I guess it's my turn. I've got um, got a couple. I've got a question. Um, landscape two, L two. If you could bring that up. I actually don't have that right here. I'd have to go grab it from the server real quick. If you want to, I can try to do it. All right. Uh, what I what I can say is, uh, on L two, you have what looks like a street tree. Um, just below just uh, close to the curve line it says AC and I can't find that actually but I've left my uh, magnifying glass at home okay so there we go down down below here And over to the entrance right there. Okay, you can see that street tree? Yep. Um, I, I guess I have a concern. We've, we've spent some, some time making sure that there's a sight line. As that tree grows, is there going to be a problem with the sight line there? So we've worked it out with the traffic peer reviewer um, that basically one tree is not an issue with a sight line. It's just when we get the rows of trees, because as you look at something, with the rows of all the trunks that creates the wall. One has never been an issue before, and we've set that precedent earlier on in the project. So uh, it's a good question, um, but we have vetted that out, and that was shown on our site distance diagrams, and we vetted out with the traffic and peer reviewer that typically one, while looking in the site distance, isn't creating an issue. Okay, yeah. uh, what kind of a tree is that? Um, the other, well, yeah, not probably the wrong, AC, yeah. <laughs> the wrong person to ask that, but um, there, they're supposed to have the higher canopy too, so that we can see that kind of two to four foot window of the site distance that we're looking for. So I can try to find yeah, the yeah. Uh, tree Roger, listing. Roger suggested it might be American chestnut. I couldn't find. 
couldn't find it there. Yeah, it looks like I don't see AC on here either. So I can I can check on that and have that in the next app. Yeah, I appreciate sure that. That's, yep. I think just one other comment on that. I think it's the the site window, if you will, also is between the tree and the fence that we were talking about. So I think what the traffic engine consultant was looking for is good sight lines to the curve um, in making sure that's open versus that tree is quite close to the entrance. And it's, um, I don't believe it's the view corridor that they were concerned with. I guess I gotta go back to. All right, well, I, you know, I'm assuming that uh, that will be, the name of the tree will be taken care of for the next time we hear this? Yes. Okay, and I, I, I raised the concern because I wasn't sure what that would be, but I think, you know, if you've reviewed it with the traffic engineer, then, then that works, that's fine. I have another question. The staff noted that, um, I'm reading on page two of their staff report, the applicant has provided maintenance access along gravel wetland four as requested. However, more information is needed to depict how access for maintenance vehicles will be provided from Pacer Way, as well as access for maintenance vehicles from the southerly end of gravel wetland four, four to the outfall. Did, uh, could you expand on that? Yeah, and so the access point that we provided is right here at the corner and it's basically there's a tip down for a trail. So this is also our trail connection that comes all the way down here. So we're using the maintenance road also as the trail for this portion until it crosses the wetland and connects into phase one where it's just your four foot wide forest duff trail, I'll call it. So the vehicular access for the truck is right here at the entrance of the trail where we'll have a little bit of mountable curb on each side to make sure the truck can get in there. Um, and it's a 10 foot clear with berm essentially that we're using for the stormwater facility. And again, we've done this on other gravel wetlands around and we actually do this at the innovation district too, the wet pond. Um, it's basically a 10 foot wide berm, um, stone dust, and it carries and so that, so that allows access all the way down to the spillway and the outlet control structure and stuff that you'd have to go and clean out and get down in maintenance. Um, and as well as you continue down here, this is just a, a long pipe outlet to get to the elevation we need to. And on top of that, we have our 10 foot path for truck to get down to the plunge pool down there to ever clean that out if necessary. So um, again, I worked, I worked with the town engineer on this um, and just and just showed her the, the actual intention there. And it's all graded so that it's not anything steep and there's clear width for someone to get around there. There's maintenance easements too as well. Can I ask? Uh, yeah, sure. I Just answer. One thing. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, so Drew did pull out the plans earlier this morning, and I think one of the concerns though was obviously coming off Pacer and having that ability to not just have a five foot tip down area to be able to get a truck through there, but to be able to actually be mountable, like you said, and then also getting down to the the, the final outfall. And so I think the typical detail we talked about was making sure we have that full ten foot width. So. It'll just be something that I have to review. I think from where he has described it, it sounds like what we had talked about. I just will just need to see the plans to kind of go through that. So I haven't fully vetted kind of, I just didn't want you to. <laughs> but, but, but you're comfortable that it's on With its it way to being forward, resolved. It sounds like they're, they're addressing my concerns. It's just, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the, the specific details, like I said, like looking at that curb line and things like that. So that's all I just want to take a look at. All right, thank you. Uh, Roger? Yeah, a, a question pertaining to this. So is a vehicle, maintenance vehicle, going to be driving uh, straight down and then basically have to back up all the way, or is there a place where they're going to be able to make a turn? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you'll be able to turn around down there. It's going to be, you're going to have like a 20-foot cleared width, just enough to get it out and be stumped and grub and low and seed, and I can provide a little bit wider down there and make sure you back up. I mean, the type of trucks we're talking that go down there doesn't need much, and we can, we'll, we'll give something to be able to turn around so that that's not a long, uh, tough backup all the way down there. So yes, we'll provide that on the, uh, we'll make sure that gets on there. All right, thank you. And I do want to note the staff's uh, comment or mention that the, there is a five year moratorium within Sawgrass Drive and approval of the public works director will be required for this work in the public right of way. Um, are you making plans for actually how you're going to make that connection? 
Yeah, and actually I reached out to the public works director about a month ago and got the moratorium detail we needed to. So that's on the plan set. Um, and it's basically just full width and he didn't, uh, we, worked, we worked together on what the actual limits were. So they're shown on the plans for the actual full restoration and the details shown. So um, that should be all taken care of. All right, thank you. Um, board have any more questions? Uh, we can put this, you're comfortable enough that we put this on the agenda for next meeting as a consent agenda once uh, we see some of the changes in the details that we've talked about tonight plus the permits. We all set? All right, for uh, the ne our next meeting, which I believe is the 20th, we will put, we will have this on the consent agenda. Thank you very much. And the next item is Front Runner Park Condominiums, LLC, request a site plan review for lot 40 within the town center residential subdivision, assessor's map R52, lot four. Uh, I will also say that when we are finished with this section, we will, for those of you who are getting antsy, we will uh, take a brief break. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as you may recall, this was also before you uh, back in July. The applicant's proposing uh, three 12 unit residential condominium buildings and six garage buildings. Uh, so staff did note in the review comments that the fire department has raised concerns related to emergency access to buildings A and B. However, staff does understand that the applicant was able to coordinate with them on this issue. So the applicant should be sure to discuss any of uh, the, any outcomes as a result of the coordination. Staff continues to recommend uh, buffering provisions along the easterly property line uh, between the proposed gar garages and single family homes as part of this project. And staff also continues to recommend some sort of facade or window treatment along the rear facades of the garages that will face uh, the single family homes in the future. And um, similar to the last one, um, Given that the board will not be able to take any formal action tonight, given that Lot 40 has not been officially created, um, and that a few plan modifications are still required, uh, staff recommends that the board consider this project be placed on the next agenda as well as a consent, um, if the board's comfortable with that approach. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And for the applicant, Drew. Thank you. I'm going to start this one off this time. So again, Drew Gang, Burrell Palmer. Um, just gonna go over again the changes that we've had. We've seen this once before. Um, so same location we've been talking about all night right here in the Downs. Um, this is the perspective that we shared and I believe is in your packages as well. Um, we shared this last month or month and a half ago. Um, the kind of the view looking down the central green that we're going for. Um, these are the three 12 unit condominium buildings. Uh, so it's 33 two bedroom and three one bedroom. That's the split up. So it's 11 two bedroom and one and then one one bedroom in that same building. So this is the I'll call just the current layout after some discussion with the fire department. Um, so we don't have complete full sign off on them, um, but we've been coordinating with them back and forth and we're at a very, very close um, this is this is essentially what the layout is going to be. So as you'll notice it really layout wise hasn't changed at all we've just we've just added some uh widened some sidewalks on the middle down here the fire lanes um, on the south end and as a result of that we actually combined one of the garages on the or combined two of the four unit garages on the northwest corner here to provide for the access of the fire truck so um, we've been working with the fire department uh back and forth pretty much every day for the last week um and we're we're, we're real close so this is essentially what it's going to be i just need to get last minute um, coordination items but uh, I just wanted to provide the board with kind of what it would look like so um, again if you step back and you compared this to what was provided um, it's very very close none of the buildings have moved um, it's just widened sidewalks essentially to get that fire truck in there where they're looking for so um, in addition to this this is the current utility plan again I just wanted to mention that 
from the last application package. Um, we're providing a small pump station, private pump station that'll be owned by the condominium development um, for building A, and this is gonna be pumped up to Sawgrass. Uh, this is in coordination with Scarborough Sanitary District, so this is their request again. Um, so we're working all that out. Um, I just wanted to provide that not everything is a gravity sewer system for this one. Um, that's just one small change that we've had. Again, it's all below ground. Um, this is a real small private pump station. There's nothing big that's gonna pop out of the ground. These are pretty typical small 40-inch fiberglass contained pump stations that are just below ground. Um, so I went over the fire lane revisions uh, with the fire department. Um, and I do wanna talk about the buffering along the Eastern property line real quick. Um, so as we discussed last month, um, having some buffering as based on um, town comments, staff comments, some buffering along with the single family here. Um, we committed to it and we're still committing to it absolutely with this development. Uh, we're requesting that, that the buffering, the vegetate buffering, trees, plantings, so be it, um, are, are tied to the single family building permit applications. So for every one of these single family lots that come in to develop the lot, we have to provide a, uh, essentially a building permit site plan. Um, and we're more than willing to line up the vegetation with that site plan. Um, we think it makes sense to go with that um, so that basically we can put the trees and the vegetated on the plan where it makes sense for the house. Cause I don't, I, I don't want to arbitrarily just put up the trees on the lot 40 lot and then it doesn't actually work well with the budding neighbor and house. So the trees will still be on lot 40 side. They'll still be the responsibility of lot 40. So this development, um, but and it, uh, it's gonna get coordinated with each single family there. Um, that goes back to some of the phases that we talked about for the fourth amended subdivision, where this is gonna get built first. There's actually not gonna be anyone there for you know the period of time until we can pull the growth permits and we can build the infrastructure up for the road on the right hand side. Um, so, so we'd like to, and request that those vegetated items go with the single family building permits. Um, and in addition to that, what will help is the grading can then be completely tied in. So we're not, again, placing the tree and then we have to revise it or bury the trunk a little bit because the single family house lot grading wanted to go up or down based on, um, based on lot configuration really. So um, we're totally committed to it. I just wanted to request that that gets tied to that so that we can just overall have a nice development there. Um, so the garage side and rear facades, um, we had some comments last about having the windows on the side that face the public street. So that was provided in the planning board package and essentially the side elevation that faces the street is shown on the right hand side of the screen. Um, along the back, we, uh, we talked about last time, um, basically with the trees um, agreed upon at the planning board meeting that the trees would provide the, the buffer between the single family and the garages there. Um, we did add some vertical trim pieces to break up the, the, long, um, the long siding that we had along those long garages. So we have added some other elements there to break up that, um, that consistent look of that, um, that siding. So uh, we, do, we are requesting that we don't th throw the windows on the back of the garage buildings. Um, we think that from a one, a privacy standpoint, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And also we think the trees are gonna provide that kind of level of, of buffering along that back of the garage. Um, so uh, we're just requesting that we, we keep it as this design here with the trees there um, as discussed at the last planning board meeting. Um, and again, just to go back, we have provided, because it was a town comment and a traffic engineering comment, uh, we provided the fence along the lot 40 side as I discussed with the fourth amended subdivision um, and the same DEP statement that I've, we've said four times now also applies here. So i um, happy to discuss this anymore um, and I look forward to uh, further deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody shown up on the... Remote? No. no? Anybody in the room? <laughs> no? All right. Let us go to the board. Raji, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, uh, I tend to agree with, um, with the applicant regarding the windows in the back of the garage on the eastern side. And I'd like a clarification, if I may. Um, on, on the staff comments, but the, the last one on the first page, uh, it says blank walls facing residential neighborhoods are prohibited, right? Then on the very next page, it says staff continues to recommend. That seems to contradict. 
when it, when it says prohibited, that's pretty, that's pretty finite, you know, that's, and then it says staff continues to recommend. So it's, that to me gives us some leeway when you say you recommend. Staff's recommending that the project follows the standards. Okay. Yeah, that's what that means. So they would have to, they would have to request a waiver. Is that what they would have to do? No, um, I, I think when when the staff is recommending windows, there are potential potentially architectural features that would um, mitigate the blank wall. Um, now, whether three vertical boards in the space of a hundred feet or so mitigate a blank wall becomes a question for us. The staff is recommending the windows. Um, there are, uh, simply because the blank wall is, is prohibited. So, so, uh, so there are alternatives. All we're seeing is the three vertical pieces of wood. Um, if there's something in between, we haven't seen it. Okay, I guess I guess I don't recall seeing the three vertical pieces of wood. It, it's on the it's on the the plan. They did on, on these. Yes. Okay. Um, so in other words, staff is recommending either windows or something else to break up the the, the blank wall. Is that, is that what you? I think staff can answer that. Yes, I mean the, the comment states windows. Um, that's where. We recommend. Um, there are other options as well, but Windows was the was the option that we went with. Does can we hear from the applicant if they if they have any other suggestions if um, if it's going to be Windows or right? So our proposal is essentially a back of a garage like this. Um, how close to the property line it is acts as a fence. Um, and so rather than putting up a fence, you know, in front of the garage, um, our intention is to have landscaping be between the back, the rear yard of each single family home and the garage to, to break up the mass, the linear mass of the garage. Uh, in addition, we added some vertical elements to, to break up, uh, the length of siding, um, there they're not shown super bright here, just given the colors uh, of the building. It's, the trim is the same color as the siding, so that's why it's probably, Roger, hard to see. Um, breaking up that length of siding. So we're really um, reluctant to be adding windows in a garage from another project into backyards of single family homes. Um, and also, the intention with the planting plan is just to, to obscure the garage. So over time, you're not looking at much of the garage. You're going to see the siding in between a few plantings, but it's mostly going to be landscaping. So um, I guess the final piece, as Drew indicated, is we really want the planting plan that's p the people's backyard, the, the home development, uh, the buyers or the developer of each home to have a say in those plantings because it's really, they're the only ones benefiting from them. Um, it's not the condo uh, development, it's not the public, um, it's their backyard. So that's why we're proposing that they be planted in conjunction with the single family homes because it's really an amenity to them um, than more than anybody else. Um, well, personally, I tend to agree with you because if I <clears throat> own that single family home, I don't necessarily want to be looking at a window with some something hanging from the window inside the garage. You know, um, per, you know, I'd rather have just a wall with some some plantings or some landscaping or whatever. So if there's another option to satisfy the the ordinance, uh, I would I prefer to go with that than the windows. I think staff's pretty comfortable with that approach, but we do have concerns. Oh, I'll speak for you. I don't want to, I don't want to speak for Angela. <laughs> We do have concerns about, you know, what happens if the single family homes don't get developed and then the garages are just there and the plantings aren't coordinated as suggested. It's a good idea, but, you know, we're just trying to take each project separately and just in case the houses 
you know, the project doesn't work out and they don't build them, so. Well, on their, on their plan notes for this project, wouldn't they, wouldn't they state that you're making that commitment on the single family homes? We're making the commitment, yeah, that the plantings go in in conjunction with individual house development. Um, right, but you, we're not going to build the road before, if we're not going to move forward with that phase. Um, so there won't really be a view of the garage unless the road's been built and we're proceeding with house construction. Uh, Roger, let me just ask one question of Dan for clarity. Uh, is it Crossroads Development that's going to be building those single family homes? Or is it uh, different developers and it's different developers? Affiliates of, it's Riz Bear Brothers, of, you know, affiliates of Crossroads. Yes. On all of them? That's my understanding, but I, I can't say that definitively 100%, so. Um. Okay, so we don't know who's actually going to be building those single family houses while they are appear to be phase two, could be Risperra Brothers, could be Crossroads, could be uh, any other developer that's not determined yet. So we have kind of an unknown in terms of who's going to be putting in the houses and um, I guess how to ensure that there are the plant promised plantings that are done. And that's something that's possible to work out, but it is at this point kind of kind of an unknown. Well, Risbera will be responsible regardless who, who the builder is. Is that correct, Dan? Well, and there's a subdivision plan note that binds those lots from providing plantings um, that was added. So it is is going to be Risbera for the majority of the lots, but it also binds that the, the plantings be provided as part of the plot plan for each single family house application. And Dan, could you speak a little louder? I had difficulty. Oh, <laughs> take my mask off. Um, the subdivision plan has a plan note requiring that plantings be provided with each, we have to submit a plot plan for each house. With that plot plan, the plantings would be, a planting plan would be provided. So even if someone else bought uh, a lot, there would be the expectation that they be put in. Rachel, can, can I just um, clarify, just from staff's um, perspective, I'm trying to figure out, because it's really going to fall on code enforcement, right? So as these come in, and I'm trying to figure out um, how you would put a condition of approval, and maybe you can get me there, Dan, mm -hmm. was um, a condition of approval on this lot that requires another lot to do something, right? So, uh, and I know we'll get this individual plot plan but you're saying the trees will actually be on someone else's property. It'll be a lot. As no, the intention said, is it to be, be right on. on I think Drew said that, and I didn't jump up and okay. say no. <laughs> um, okay. The intention is that it's right on the, the rear property line. Um, and if it needs to be on the first five feet of the single family lot, that's fine. There's, only, there's three feet of space. So there's the garage. There's a, a drip, uh, drip line, if you will, gravel area. And then there's three feet, um, and then it's the rear property line. So, um, so you're putting the responsibility on another lot, though, to do the buffer for this lot. It's I guess that's how I'm trying to figure out how code enforcement would be able to, um, I guess, ensure that's happening if the condition is on this lot. I, I guess that's where I'm struggling. I mean, there's, there's. I, I'm struggling too, so that's. <laughs> can, can I... And it's just about it's trying to get, I guess, how you, how we reinforce it. Yeah, make... uh, uh, Jen yeah. has a yeah, comment. Um, just a suggestion. Uh, again, not sure if this is entirely possible, but the way that I understood, or the way that I heard, um, the way that you were explaining this was, generally that you were intending to plant behind these garages and offering the opportunity for these single family lot owners to have a say in what those plantings are. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, even though the plantings will be on the, the lot 40 or is that, yeah, the, the, 
on the garage property, not necessarily on the single family home property. Is that right? There's a limited amount of space. So we're okay. trying to establish, I guess, the right approach so that those plantings, ben they benefit the single family homeowners. They're, yep. they're backyard plantings. Yep. They're screening a garage. Um, so, and so, so whether they're right on the property line or um, if they're, you know, I think that's to be decided. Um, we are trying to establish an, an approach that single family homeowners get a choice in the plantings and they, they be installed at that time because otherwise we're gonna damage those plantings, how we're phasing the project, how we're doing the grading, how we're making decisions on proceeding with the single family homes. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing actually was required of Crown. It's a different end of the project, but the board required a buffer to the next door lot, which actually was on the next door lots plan or site so that parking lots didn't get too close together. So, um, We've been thinking about its different context, obviously, but we've been thinking about it in the same kind of light. So, um, so if I were to buy one of these single family lots, you would approach me at some point during that process and say, hey, we, we have to install some plantings behind these garages. Uh, we were thinking of doing X, Y, and Z kind of trees. Um, or do you have a preference in the type of plantings that go there? And I might say, Yes, I would love to see, I don't know, whatever, cedars I think or we'd have a minimum planting plan. Like this is the, the and we do that for other okay. single family house construction where, okay, you have these plantings. If you want to pay extra and supplement, yep. then you, you do that. So we would treat it the same way, much like we treat plantings along the street between the sidewalk and sure. a home. So they're consistent and things. Yeah. So I wonder if, um, you know, I... Uh, absolutely understand the position that uh, Jamel and or Angela stated earlier, which is that, and I um, go by this myself as well in reviewing any projects that we see, which is what happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if this stalls out? And I fully recognize that as like, you know, the most doomsday approach to it, but I feel like that's, uh, that's part of our responsibility. We, there's also terrific precedent on this entire development that, that that's really not at all <laughs> the case that you're dealing with. And so more than likely, these are going to sell very quickly and be developed very quickly. So I just wonder if there may be some sort of um, time frame that we could apply to this that would be long enough that um, you know it could reasonably accommodate the uh, the, the future owner of these single family homes to come to the table and have a say on those plantings. And that if for some reason, if no one buys those lots beyond X amount of time, um, then maybe, uh, maybe plantings get selected by this team and installed at that time. And that, yes, that would, you know, potentially have um, implications on those single family homes down the road but it does kind of protect what we're, um, you know, the, the, the very off chance that they don't get developed in a reasonable time frame, And mm -hmm. that just, you know, if, if, if nothing gets built beyond the back of those garages, then at least they're not um, plain solid garages, I guess. And so, you know, if that, whatever that period of time, I'm not sure <laughs> what a reasonable option for that would be, but um, my guess is that that's not, you're not even going to come close to meeting that based on how I understand your current sales are going there. So uh, that's my peace offering between the yeah. what, conversation that I was hearing before. Um, and then I guess, so I do, um, which I, and you know, I actually think that that approach is really, um, you know, it's smart and kind for these potential property owners, you're recognizing that this is their backyard and that garage doesn't need trees behind it or I don't care what plantings go behind my garage, you know. <laughs> um, so so uh, I, I, I do think there's some good intent there. But I also recognize the intent of the ordinance and I think kind of what we were sort of hinting at earlier was that um, perhaps there is some more middle ground to be had in terms of 
something that falls between the vertical elements, you know, the, the very minimal vertical elements that you're showing here and a full-fledged uh, glass window, which presents some issues of its own, both, you know, in both directions, I think. So um, I'm not an architect and would not pretend to be one, so I'm not even going to venture, I guess, at what type of, you know, um, next level treatment here would be appropriate, but I know that you have really skilled people on your team, and so perhaps there is another option. I don't know if, you know, a, a false window would just be like a bad attempt at that, or maybe it's a good idea. I'm not really sure. Um, or that maybe there's some other architectural elements that might be more appropriate. Um, but that would be, that would be my, my thought in terms of trying to meet the ordinance, yet not maybe introducing a full window that um, would be staring into someone's garage or into someone's backyard. Thank you, Jen. Rick? Um, I don't really have any questions. All right. Um, I've got uh, a few comments. Um, I, I like the direction that, that Jen is going, um, that there is something someplace with a good architect that is better than, um, I guess, actually two vertical um, elements uh, and full-fledged windows up and down. Um, and we have in the past used um, faux windows uh, if the concern is privacy. Uh, some of those have been less than uh, less than classy, let me say, uh, and others have been pretty effective. Uh, I, I do want to uh, just not caution, but remind you of one thing, and, and you keep saying that this buffering is for the benefit, uh, is the benefit of the single family homeowners. I don't call it a benefit. It's a requirement that they not have to look at a blank wall and you as the developer have the responsibility for ensuring that they don't have to look at a blank wall. In other words, that they are not disadvantaged by putting in um, windows, trees, uh, some, other, some other visual um, variety, uh, you are eliminating an eyesore or a disadvantage. It's not specifically a benefit to them as such. Uh, it's a requirement. So um, I guess I, I would like to see if you can uh, come up with a couple of things for the next meeting. And, and one is something in between what's here, uh, what you've offered with the, the two vertical elements and full windows, uh, and a way to ensure that the board is and the staff are comfortable that those tr trees and the buffering is going to go in in a reasonable period of time uh, and that it will meet all of the standards that we have for landscaping. Um, it is something that is the responsibility of this development, not the, not the single family houses. So I am going to put the burden on you to figure, figure out how to help us become comfortable with something that's a little different there. Um, and speaking of that, I have another question. Uh, well, I mean, one, one minor question. That is that you've talked about putting in Adirondack chairs. Yeah. Um, are they movable? Yes. OK. I. I know there was something that suggested that a site, uh, that some sort of a plan or um, a plan go in uh, in terms of what they would look like. It's tough when you're dealing with movable chairs. And as soon as somebody moves them, uh, somebody else is going to say, what happened to my chair? Uh, I always sit over here. Um, I would suggest that for the purposes of this development and actually the next one, that instead of coming up with a schemata uh, of what an Adirondack might look like and where you might have them, is to uh, include instead the number 
of seating options that you're going to have outside um, and a, a sense of where they are. So for instance, you might say, we will have four seating elements in this patio mm -hmm. and one on either side of every door so that when this is built out, there will be 22 seating elements. That way, um, that eliminates having to come back when, or somebody coming back when uh, the condo decides to eliminate Adirondacks and come up with rocking chairs or something else. So, in, so go with that. Uh, I think since they are movable, that makes more sense than trying to keep track of where those movable chairs are going to go. I, I also uh, appreciate what you've done uh, in terms of adding that extra patio um, or you know having that um, that vista with the the patios there uh, I think that uh, brings a lot to the uh, to the development you've asked for a waiver and that is a waiver of the parking aisle request from um, 25 to foot to 24 foot I, while we're accustomed to saying pretty much and pretty fast yes on something like this. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've been actually reading the uh, handbooks, uh, the law, and um, the site, site plan review. And it turns out, as we kind of knew, but uh, has slipped a little bit. It's the responsibility of the developer to, uh, the burden of proof is on the developer to convince us of the waiver. So let me ask you a question. You want to save, you, you want apparently to decrease the impermeable surface. How many square feet are you, um, how many square feet are you saving if we give you, if we grant that waiver? Do you have the length of the parking? Yeah, probably about. <clears throat> Two to three hundred square feet, and that property, that uh, that savings, you've invested that how in additional permeable landscaping. Well, by the reduction, if if we were to add that extra foot, we're either losing one of those three feet of planting space behind the garage that Dan was mentioning. Well, actually, you can't really lose that because you know you're required. Yep. So, there are things you're required to have, so you're not losing that. So we're losing, then on the other side, we're losing one foot of vegetative space between the back of sidewalk and the person's patio and balcony on the condo units on the top and then also on the bottom ones there and then vice versa on the other side as well. So, so, you're, so that you actually are giving them one more, one more square foot than they would ordinarily have? Correct, with the 25-foot drive aisle. And we also, in addition to that, we, we proved that the 24-foot, the turning movements to get into the parking space can still work with a 24-foot drive aisle rather than the 25-foot. So that's how, um, I guess, layout-wise, it still works. Everything's still, there's no sacrificing from backing out of the parking space and leaving it in, in, in one movement and not having to do a three-point turn to do anything like that. All right, so uh, actually, you, you had to prove that you could do that. Um, and my question, again, goes back to the amount of, of square footage. So um, I will ask you that same question when we get to the apartments. So if you might want to figure out um, where we are saving and why, why we should be granting this waiver, because it's up to you to, to actually convince us uh, the burden of proof is, is on you. So uh, thank you. Um, I don't believe I have any more questions. Does the board, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, go back to the Adirondack chairs for a second, because um, I don't want to make a big deal out of this. As I understood when you first proposed the idea of having, I think maybe like four, two or four Adirondack chairs there, which would be movable, primarily as a place where people could gather and maybe move them around depending on what they want to do. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would expect most people who are living there 
probably have their own chairs they either take to the beach or to a concert or something like that. And if I was in any of those units, I wouldn't take a chance that there might be a vacant chair down there, Adirondack chair. I would tend to bring my own chair down with me just in case the Adirondack chairs are, are all taken. So I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a good focal point. It's a good place to, you know, encouraging, uh, encourage neighboring, say, yeah. among the, the people who live there. But I, I don't think, I think it'd be kind of unrealistic for the people to go, mm -hmm. you know, if they want to go down there to think that it's always going to be a chair available there and they could bring their own. So I just want to add. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the big picture of the intent is we want this to be a comfortable community um, and want it to feel like a neighborhood and feel like Adirondack chairs, um, you know, a reasonable number, you know, based on the population of each development are a lot more residential and comfortable than putting in benches that um, are certainly more kind of um, urban or public or not quite as neighborly, if you will. I think benches are great along public sidewalks um, in a project like this or in the city of Portland, um, we've been feeling they're kind of out of place with a condominium neighborhood, a single family neighborhood where we're uh, trying to establish uh, more of a casual sense of community. So um, we certainly can give you a sense for what we're thinking on each of the two areas. You know, we have two patio areas, if you will, um, a larger one between the two buildings that are, you know, across from each other and a smaller one by um, the more northerly building. And, you know, we've kind of sized those for uh, proportionally to the people that are likely to use them. Um, so that's the intent of it and think it's a better fit for a project like this than benches that are just kind of placed in, in places that. Yeah, and that, that's, that why, that's why I suggested that you give us a number of chairs that you're going to start off with and, you know, in general, some location yeah. and understanding that people are going to move them. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to be shuffled around. People are going to bring down their own. Uh, it is going to be a community, but instead of, since you're not putting fixed benches, mm -hmm. uh, it would be kind of tough if you said, well, we're going to have four here and somebody goes and looks and there were three and said, but I'm supposed to have four. Uh, so just the number yeah. and, um, a bit on the design so that uh, we've got some clarity. It's not going to. Um, Adirondack chair. So they're pretty. Well, they're, you know, it's going to have an forward. arch back or a straight back. <laughs> you know, they're, they're a lot. Go, go past Pierce's outdoor uh, and take a look at the different styles of Adirondack right. chairs. Um, so rather than <laughs> come up with the fixed benches, yeah, uh, come up with a number and a general, a general placement. Understood. Thank right. you. I have uh, I have no more questions. Anybody else? Um, let me ask uh, Jamel and Angela if you think this is ready. If you think there's enough guidance here, uh, and ask you, Dan, as well, if you think that this is going to be able to be a consent item at the next meeting, Jamel. I guess my question is, are you comfortable with staff reviewing the con timeline for the plantings and the architectural elements? Or would you guys like to review that as part of your deliberation? I'm comfortable with staff reviewing it. I mean, the building, every dwelling is going to need a certificate of occupancy, right? So before the certificate of, of occupancy gets issued, we can make sure that the plantings are there. So there's there's checks and, checks and balances built into the system system as well. Uh, that is that for the single family house lots, though. Each yeah, I guess I'm little, still a little confused. We'll work with staff on what we're <laughs> thinking for a mechanism on that. Yeah. I, I think we can get yeah, there. I, so I, I, it sounds as though if uh, staff is comfortable with that mechanism. Um, for ensuring that the plantings are going in uh, and the staff is comfortable with a um, can I with a proposal on what would be different in terms of if not windows then what yeah 
uh, Angela. I guess my, my other questions you guys talked about was timing. I know Dan mentioned Crown, which was an easement on someone else's mm -hmm. property. Are we suggesting we want an easement on the single family house lots with I, them to be able to do plantings? <clears throat> I, I'm I'm timing, I'm suggesting that we need piece. something, and yeah. if it's an easement that works, if there is um, something um, on each single family lot that says, if you buy this lot, you're also getting X, Y, and Z from yeah. so yeah. and so. We have a we'll work with staff on that. I mean, I'd use Crown as an example because it's not that we want an easement, but it's one property owner executing something that is on another property owner's land, and that. Um, provides that kind of buffer. It might not have been the perfect example. It's just kind of an example of edge treatments. So we can certainly... No, no, no. I think that's a good idea, I think. Yeah. Because that way you have to at least show some kind of viable plan that could work, and we can change it in the yeah. field, but at least it's in an easement that you guys have control over when you go to plant it, whereas it, after the fact, if that lot gets sold, you have less control or no control. It's not your lot anymore. Right. I think that's, that's I guess, the problem. There. Yeah, our so preference would be do. executing the landscaping, but ultimately the landscaping is the single family homes landscaping because it's what they're <laughs> going to be viewing, you know, to have the condo trim their shrubs on their side of the lawn. Uh, I don't think it logistically doesn't make sense. We'll come up with something to work with you on. And the only other thing I guess I have um, it's not clear yet is I'm not aware, I guess, of what changed from the fire department's conversation, and that might have implications, say, on snow storage areas, landscape areas, stormwater. Like, I, I guess I don't know. When you're talking about widening areas for the fire department to get in there, that might have a chain reaction for other things that I, I guess maybe Drew can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, as far as impervious area goes, we have threshold development for this lot, and we're well under it from our DEP permitted threshold. So there's no sacrificing any other area in order to add so uh, wider the fire line. water calcs will change, but you'll be able to submit those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. And then for landscaping or snow storage areas? Yeah, I mean, we, we're gonna look at it again. The, the, the general layout of it didn't really change. So if I need to trim some snow storage and add it to the area that it wasn't there, we'll certainly do that on the next round there for staff review, so. Because I was just looking in between buildings, you have. 20 feet separation between buildings and usually a fire lane is 20 feet. So and that's also where you're showing landscaping and snow storage. So I was just trying to figure out where. Yep, we're gonna get all that coordinated together, so. You comfortable, Angela? Um, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. We have a week to go through a lot of information. <laughs> so. Well, they I, can I, submit I for I, any how meeting. Is, how is Jamel <laughs> feeling about this? <laughs> uh, I, uh, they can submit for any meeting, so we'll figure it out. All right. If uh, if it is not for consent uh, at the next meeting, it's because the town and the applicant have been unable to work out um, what's necessary. Correct, and it would just be a future. Yeah, and it would be set well, for a future I guess meeting. Maybe I should ask Dan because I, I don't want to throw a monkey wrench in anything. I guess if you guys are coming back, say for a what. How does it work for you? Does it make a difference if you're coming back for consent on the 20th as opposed to coming back with maybe some conditions and we have a more another yeah. conversation? Does it change your timeline? I mean, some of the things we've talked about are often conditions of approval. Right. Um, exactly. So, so that's what I'm we'd saying. prefer that because, I mean, we're really kind of just fighting weather. So um, right. kind of activating... And Foundations is kind of the critical path, not, um, you know, working with you on making sure snow storage works. And that's uh, where for I was example. saying I'd feel more comfortable if we could get to a place where we at least say, okay, there's still these little things, but it can be a condition of approval. But I know without Jay here, I know he spoke specifically with our town attorney about you guys turning around and having it a consent item allows you to get back on for the 20th. Mm -hmm. If it's not a consent item... Is that still, do you know, viable? Oh, in terms of? Yeah. <laughs> well, often, I mean, you can table 
any item, whether it's a or consent it could be or a consent item that we could pull off consent if we have concerns. Yeah, a consent can... item is okay. you either approve it as the motion's written, or you want to actually talk about it. It still can be a consent item if you had, if the board's not comfortable with the motion or like had a question. Oh, yeah. how did you deal with the facade of the garage, for example? Okay. All right, let's um so you're, let's, I think I'm comfortable with that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, let, let's let's that. go with it as a consent <laughs> item with the understanding if um the, there's not a meeting of the minds, we can have a continued discussion as part of the consent and perhaps change uh the conditions of approval and as a result of that discussion at that meeting. It Absolutely. would also give the board a chance to actually look at the architecture. Yes. And if you're good with it, it's still a consent and if not, yeah. you can have a conversation about it, right? That would be great. Does that work? All right, thank you. Thank you for accommodating that. Thank you very much. We're going to take a five minute break, five minutes from whatever time your watch says now. I lost my mask. Here it is.
Let us uh, reconvene. Item nine, Hackamore Place Apartments, LLC, re requests a site plan review for lot 41 within the town center residential subdivision, assessor's map R52, lot four. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is on lot 41, the town center residential subdivision, um, and there's the applicants proposing three 12-unit apartment buildings and one garage building. And I'm going to keep it short. Uh, similar issues as the last project um, in terms of um, the buffering of the garage building and the wall facing the future single family homes. Um, and staff has the same suggestion um, if the board's comfortable uh, with the consent item for the next agenda. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Drew. Thank you, Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer, um, representing Hackamore Place Apartments, LLC. I'm just gonna skip right to it here. The rendering that was provided last time, nothing's changed on it, um, showing the, the central green here in front of the apartment buildings. Um, so I believe it's 22 bedroom apartments and 16 one bedroom apartments, split between three buildings here. Um, there's a 112 unit car garage on this side. Um, Nothing's really changed on this one since the last time I presented it. Um, this has been had just full sign off of everything. Um, we are requesting that the drive all go from 25 to 24 feet. Um, we're saving that one foot of impervious area along each drive aisle, which will add up to approximately four to 500 square feet of vegetated area for the condominium, or excuse me, for the apartment patios. So we're essentially by allowing and holding the same buffer, we're providing another 400 feet of vegetated area in the common green space that we think is valuable to the project. In addition, in the overall stormwater management design, we are downsizing the ponds um, four to 500 more square feet of re related impervious area. So between these two projects, we, uh, we should be close to seven to 800 square feet of impervious area, which is limiting our impact to the environment uh, at the larger stormwater facility. Uh, utility plan, we've had some updates here. Again, as I mentioned during the fourth amended, um, we're providing gravity sanitary service. It's going to the gravity line to the future pump station in the center of the project. Um, previously, it was um, connecting to the system that's tributary to technology way. Um, so this is being reviewed by the Scarborough Sanitary District, um, but this is based off their initial discussions. This is what we've changed it to. So we're all set there from a, um, just a pretty much low impact, again, everything below ground type development um, change here to just go into the different stand, storm drains, uh, excuse me, different sanitary system. Um, so it's really like, uh, as Jamel said in, in the introduction, it's the same issues that were brought up in the town comments. Um, and we're confident we can come to a resolution with the trees um, as well as the the um, rear facades there of the garages um, and uh, adjacent to the single family homes. Um, so I know we can come to a, a clean arrangement where it'll benefit both single family homeowners as well as the project and we can tie it to something. Um, we've already had some good ideas floating around so we're pretty confident we can get to that and uh, meet all parties needs. Um, and that's all I have for this one. So thank you. Thank you. And do we have anybody in the audience? Okay. Uh, I, I do uh, want to comment before I turn this over to the rest of the board, and that is thank you for estimating the amount of uh, permeable service that you've um, created uh, and expect that question to continue. Thank you. Uh, board, questions, observations, comments? <clears throat> Basically, it's pretty much pretty similar to the last one. I think, unless I'm missing something. <laughs> I have nothing further. Jen? I don't have anything uh, beyond prior comments. No. Nope. I'd just like to say that I like the layout, and, and um, I think this is going to be a nice area of this development. Okay, Roger. Yeah, I just want to add something before you guys leave. Uh, on all your presentations on the screen, you initially showed the master plan. 
I, I think that was great. I, I first saw that at the um, workshop we had. And I think if you could include that in almost all your presentations, updated, that, that's really great. Yeah, I let me uh, let me add to uh, to support Roger's suggestion because it helps to orient where this is in relation to to everything else and and what's left. Um, I think I don't believe I had. Oh, I I, I did want to comment on the larger patio at the um, conjunction of the two sidewalks. Um, I appreciate you adding that. I think that goes uh, um, that goes a long way to providing a good gathering space for apartment dwellers. Uh, and let's do the same thing there um, with the uh, Adirondacks, uh, including in terms of numbers and the uh, general where where they're going to be, just so that we have that have that sense. Uh, I think um, if you reach an agreement with the town staff uh, on the issues that we've talked about, uh, we can, let's say that this is a consent agenda for the next meeting. Uh, if we have additional questions or material that we really need to take a look at, we can ask those questions. If we end up not satisfied, then we would then start to pass it on to another meeting. But I think we can come up with the conditions of approval uh, and if you are working with the staff, uh, that will enable this to go through. Uh, does the staff have uh, any comments, remaining comments? I do not. No? All right. Wow. Okay. Thank you. See you. Is that a record? <laughs> <laughs> See you next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Over there, the third amended. Oh, uh, sure. And the uh, item number 10, Moco Tech LLC requests a preliminary subdivision review for 124 Sawyer Road Assessors Map R54, Lot 4. Uh, let me just remind uh, the board that as a preliminary review, um, we provide them with guidance. Uh, we can pass them on to do a final uh, site review if, if we think that, that they're ready for that, that the application's ready for that. Um, so let us turn this over to the staff. Jamel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this, was, this proposal is last before you in July as well. The applicant's proposing a three-lot subdivision on a single property uh, that can, currently consists of one single-family home. And the proposal also includes an additional curb cut along Sawyer Road. So as required by the ordinance, or the zoning ordinance, the applicant's proposing a village green space of almost of nearly 1,900 square feet at the rear of lots one and two. So the applicant should be prepared to discuss the details associated with this feature and the proposed ownership to ensure this common area is maintained for property owners in the future. And the police department has noted that this portion of Sawyer Road has actually exhausted all available address numbers. And any additional lots will need to be addressed off a of named private driveway in accordance with town standards. Um, so the applicant should coordinate with police on this issue prior to resubmitting the final plan. And staff also had, a, had questions related to the proposed stormwater feature and who will be responsible to maintain it in the future. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And for the applicant. Yes, good evening. My name is Paul Gabbush. I prepared the plan that you have in front of you this evening. And I certainly would like to see the plan versus me on the screen if that's possible. But <laughs> I don't know you if you, very, you, I don't look, know if you, you can look bring very it up. Dapper. You'll have to plug in your computer. I don't have a computer. So is that something? Yeah, I guess. Are you kidding me? Maybe I'll have to have Angela show me how to do this. <laughs> I will be presenting this evening. <laughs> You'll have to do the talking here. Well, that's more remote, right? Uh, sort of. All right, I guess this is the best I can 
That's good. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> uh, I think I could probably learn how to do this. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I guess the, the biggest uh, question is the village green space that I'm proposing. I'm actually proposing the green space along the rear of lot one and along the rear of lot two for a total area of 1,898 square feet. We're only required to have 10%, it's a little bit over the 10% requirement because I deducted the wetlands that was part of that open space area. So I do have a net area required in that village green space. <clears throat> um, the applicant would like not to have a homeowner's association associated with the project. Um, she's hoping that speaking with her attorney that we could handle the lot one would have village green space associated with it and the lot one would have to maintain that area by basically just mowing it on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. The same thing with lot two. This existing lawn, it'll be for, you know, probably horseshoes or, you know, type of passive recreation. Uh, I don't think it's going to get used very often, to be quite frankly with you. Um, lot three would have access and their deed to that village green space area. As far as the stormwater, there is a slight depression on lot one, so I can collect some of the stormwater runoff from that proposed driveway and also from the existing house so I can mitigate the flows off site. That depression is like one foot deep. It's going to be loam and seed. It's basically going to look like a lawn, so lot one would be basically responsible to mow that area. And that can also be part of a deed restriction that they have to maintain and mow that area on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis or whatever we think is appropriate. I know my wife would be every two weeks, every two, every three days, but obviously we have to put something in the deed to make sure that it gets done. As far as the stormwater for lot two, it's just basically a roof line drip edge that's going to discharge to another drain to the ditch. So they'll basically be maintaining their own stormwater for the lot two. <laughs> Same thing with lot three, we're proposing a stone line drip edge uh, to handle the stormwater runoff from that proposed site. So we're hoping that that would be acceptable to the board and her lawyer or my client's attorney thinks we can do that in, in, in a deed form. And if the board is, is in disagreement with that, then she's not opposed to doing a homeowner association if that's what the board feels is necessary. I think that was the biggest issue with the project as far as I'm concerned. She did meet with the police, so we did get a letter from the police department today. The existing driveway, which services the existing house and now will serve the existing house and a new development, that will be called My Way, and that was approved by the police department. So lot one will have an address of one my way and lot two will have an address two my way and lot three will have the current address, which is I think 124 Sawyer Road. So we do have a, I do have a letter in the file saying that was approved. Certainly we'll submit that during the packet instead of just giving it to you this evening. Um, and then of course the waiver for traffic, I guess the board has to decide on whether or not they're willing to grab, uh, grant the waiver for the traffic analysis. We are certainly going to pay the road impact fee of $755 associated with the project. Um, and then the other issues were for more engineering and staff comments. Um, I have no issues whatsoever with any of the issues that the staff brought up. Um, I can go over them, but I'm not sure if it's necessary. And if the planning board wants me to go over them, I can. But um, those are all easily addressed. And actually, I think I addressed. 99% uh, of them already. Um, the only thing that I don't see is the sidewalk fee. Um, I spoke with a local contractor based on a five foot wide sidewalk, eight inches of gravel, two inches of pavement. He estimates it's about $5 a square foot. So if that's the case, we have, we would be presenting uh, the town with a fee of, and I already calculated somewhere, is $5,750. Because the site has uh, it's 230 feet of frontage on the road, times five feet for square footage, times five dollars a square foot, came out to $5,750. And we're hoping that Angela might have figures that are lower than that would be even nicer for my applicant, but uh, that's what I came up with uh, based on just a conversation with a local contractor that I do a lot of work with. 
And again, I'll be glad to go over all the other comments that uh, the planning board brought up and, and the city and, and the review engineer brought up, but uh, it's nothing that we can't handle for the future submission. Thank you. Um, before we go to board comments, I'm going to ask Jamel, um, since the, you, you brought up a non-homeowner option, and I'm going to ask Jamel uh, if that proposal is in accordance with um, or meets the re meets requirements for the town. In other words, do they need a homeowner or, is, as he has laid it out, defining responsibilities and access uh, on the deeds to each lot? Excuse me, Paul, who's going to develop this? Uh, we're going to be, actually, you're not going to be, are you building the lot houses? Yeah, I think sure. Okay, so um, if you're working with the builder, then you, okay, then you have some ab ability, I guess, to do that on the lots. But uh, Angela, yeah, go ahead. I know we spoke about um, the homeowners association, and with something like this, um, if I totally get that there's three homeowners, and I will say. I kind of like the idea of splitting up the responsibility, but making sure that responsibility is documented somewhere because it is hard to get a neighborhood association to say maintain a stormwater facility. But if you put it on one homeowner as that's your responsibility, I think that's actually easier for the town to enforce. However, I guess we'd want to see these draft deeds sure. um, because there's a lot to it. So the homeowner on lot one is signing, needs to know what they're buying. They need to know that they're buying the maintenance of the open space and they're, ma they're owning the maintenance of what a stormwater BMP is. Um, and that's, or you know what I mean? That's yep. essentially what it is. And so for a homeowner, when they're buying it, they need to know what they're buying and it needs to be really well spelled out in their deed and that's recorded forevermore. And so I kind of, I'm in favor of that as long as we see the documents that kind of lay that out very sure. specific. Yep. And so owner beware, right? So they know what they're buying. All right, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, board members. Angela actually answered the only question I had, so. Okay. Good job, Angela. <laughs> Jen. Uh, the applicant answered the only questions that I had also. All right, uh, let me uh, also, as they've requested a waiver, so um, let's take a little bit of a poll yep. on that, if you could comment on that. They've asked for a waiver of the traffic study. Can I just jump in on that? Yeah. Um, we did have our traffic consultant peer review it, um, and he had a few comments based on the first round, um, and they addressed the site distance, and he did um, uh, calculate the traffic impact fee, and staff's generally comfortable with, with that. So the applicant does not, you believe the applicant doesn't need a, its own? A, they can request the waiver, but that's, they, we have what we, what we need. Okay. Well, they, they have, I believe, requested a, a waiver. Um, so is, do we see any I'm problems with that, with that waiver? No. No? Yeah, for, okay. For single family homes, I think it's a yeah. excessive burden. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, Jen, did you have any additional? Uh, I don't have any other additional comments, but Jamel's feedback uh, in terms of the town having traffic information that's necessary, um, that waiver is also fine with me. Roger? Um, no, I'm pretty, pretty satisfied. I think most of the uh, issues tend to be engineering type issues, and I think Angela can handle all that. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering, Angela. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I've got a couple of questions, uh, uh, suggestions as, as you go along uh, with the final uh, site plan review, and that is, um, in the green, in the open space, uh, because it does abut a wetlands, um, it would be very helpful if you have some sort of um, marking of uh, the limit of disturbance there. So they can be boulders, it can be a split rail fence, something in that open space uh, that says, don't mow down here. 
um, that this is actually a wetland. It would also be helpful to have some clarity on that third house, uh, how they're going to access the open space. Uh, there's a, a small path area, but it would be helpful to make that very clear that this is how you get to that open space. Um, <clears throat> I see the, the staff continues to request a cross-section detail of the proposed driveways. I'm assuming that that's part of the engineering that will be taken care of. There's a recreation contribution fee of $500 per unit. So that's, uh, since one house is already built, that's two, that's two houses. Uh, I'm glad you resolved the issue of the, uh, of the street name uh, and, the, and the addressing that that takes care of uh, some uh, concerns there. Um, continue, please, to work with the uh, staff on the um, increase in the two-year storm event. It's it doesn't look like a lot, but you know, can it, it can mount up. So that's that's something that we would like to see on the final uh, on the final uh, site plan. Um, and when you put the, when you give us a site plan, make sure you have the location of the street trees. Uh, and let me ask Angela. Angela, um, in terms of the uh, sidewalk, is that going, the money going to the multimodal account or are they proposing to build? It sounds like you're proposing to do the in lieu fee rather than yes. building the sidewalk, correct? And I guess I will say, um, I'd like to know who the contractor is, <laughs> because right now prices are like 10 times. I will say in a normal climate, what you're giving me sounds reasonable. I would say we're not in a normal climate, but I can't, I don't know when we'll ever build a sidewalk, right? So um, I think what you, if you provide me something in writing, we can, we can accommodate what that is. Um, I will say... I typically don't go be below twenty-five dollars a linear foot, which is where you're at. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, I would say that's our bare, but that's my starting point. But then I usually want to see what. Um, but I will say right now, construction costs are skyrocketed, and there's no way I can build a sidewalk for twenty-five dollars a square, uh, five dollars a square foot. There's no way. And again, you know, this is not cur <laughs> this is not curbing. It would be like more. Right. Not it's, city right. with curbing. Right. But it's a more of a rural sidewalk. Walk, right. On the back of the ditch line. I, I get what you're saying. Right. So I, I, I think we can come to that that understanding. Um, yeah. So I'm good. All right. Thank you. Um, I do want to remind the applicant that the town has a new uh, growth management ordinance in terms of allowing uh, buildings, building permits. So please double check that. Uh, since uh, if you're working on, on the development, um, you might not have been aware of that, and it's, it's getting, uh, it's something that's pretty, it's very important, uh, and it's something that, that you're going to need to think about as you, as you said about developing. Do we, uh, Roger? Uh, yeah, just one um, question on uh, the, the new road. My way? Was Frank Sinatra way not available? <laughs> Just. Well, I was wondering if the third house was going to be called or the highway, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's getting late. Uh, yes. If we have no more questions, uh, shall we uh, basically uh, grant preliminary appro a subdivision approval um, and expect their final uh, subdivision application to come in shortly? If not, I think we are all set for the next meeting, um, but we would have a meeting in early October. Uh, and I, I would suggest you really try and shoot for that and talk to the staff uh, and get that done. Uh, and Paul is uh, telling Angela to call him. <laughs> I'll call her. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, and off you go. Did the board vote for preliminary approval or? Uh, we, we don't need to do oh, that. Okay.
we, we can simply say uh, everybody has agreed that there is a preliminary approval. There will be a formal vote uh, for the uh, final subdivision plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Staff report. Do I go first? Okay, I'll go first. Um, so I've accepted another job. Um, and my last day in Scarborough is October 1st. So my last meeting will be the next meeting. It's been wonderful working with you all. <laughs> and I hate to say this at a formal public meeting, but I really wanted to tell you guys in person and not via email. So I've um, got one more meeting with you guys. So. Are you able to tell us where you're going? Uh, sure. I got offered the director of planning position in Conway, New Hampshire. So oh, I'll be moving there. Yeah, I, I suggested several um, amenities, perhaps, that would keep him here. He rejected all of them. Uh, I did my crying at home, um, I, and I, we're going to miss you very much. Um, you've, we can all move there. We could. <laughs> I'm sure there's openings on their planning. <coughs> you deserve the position, but it stinks for us, man. You were just, you are good. Well, well, we really appreciate the work that, that you've done and uh, the forbearance you've shown to, for us uh, as we muddled through some of, some of these. And um, I think you have really set the, set the standards for the reviews of, of the downs and kept that going, kept us going, and helped us work through some of the, some of the problems that come with a... a project that size. Mm. So Thank you. really appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel. I do have a few other things. Oh, shit. OK, go ahead. Um, the Downs dropped off their subdivision plan. So if you guys could sign that um, before you leave, that'd be great. And we've had two pre-construction meetings since the last planning board meeting, which were the Pinecrest expansion project. And we actually had a on-site meeting with Patriot Acura. And they're starting to preload the site um, for 10 or 12 months or so, or 15 months, um, since the soils are so poor there. So you'll see some activity out there. All right. Angela, anything? No? I, I would just add, obviously, staff's going to be struggling for a little bit <laughs> with Jamil. Um, it's, it's amazing the amount of just product that comes through our office compared to a lot of municipalities and the stuff that, that Jamel handles seamlessly. So that's going to be a little bumpy probably for a little bit. So just be patient with us. <laughs> Phone line's always open. So. Yeah, I have your uh, cell, so I'm, I'm in good shape. <laughs> Let's... <laughs> <laughs> Administrative amendment report. Um, there were a few this month. Um, 100 Innovation Way, which is lot three at the Downs, um, had a relocation of a transformer pad. And then there were some new HVAC units with screening um, provided at the new Mint Salon Block project. That's it. All right. Minor development reviews. Yep. So this is the first one um, for minor development review, which is a staff review. Um, and it's at 2 Washington Avenue, and it's a slight addition to the existing building and a new small uh, building out back. So staff's working with the applicant on that. Yeah, if the board recalls, the, we, we did uh, develop a concept of minor development reviews and major development reviews. This is the first one that's coming through. Uh, we will have a couple for next week. Um, so let's see if, um, if the staff, if, if the developers don't like what the staff does, as a reminder, it, the developers then can bump it to us. Uh, did they like what you did? <laughs> I don't know if I would say they like it, but they're working with me. Okay, thank yeah. you. And correspondence. Nothing. Planning board comments. Um, I have one just uh, thanks for... Uh, as always, and then continued um, great organization. I I'm I solely use the Dropbox files for reviewing for these meetings, and it's just always really easy to find everything. And um, I noticed immediately the addition of the minor development review material. Um, 
and the non-project review material, which for us this time was the remote policy um, material. So thanks for that. Other comments? I thank all of you for, for coming tonight and sticking through, and uh, we got an awful lot done. Um, and saying that, you have uh, packages over here for next week for the next planning board. You can pick them up tonight or uh, arrange to pick them up tomorrow. Um, but if you can take them home tonight, I think uh, Doreen would uh, appreciate some elimination of clutter in her office. All right, thank you. We're adjourned.